two, one, we have ignition. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Intelligent Disclosure. I'm Richard Dolan with my wife, Tracy. Hi, everyone. We see you there in chat. Good all to right, see you good. all. Uh, I just want to say one thing. When I did my live stream on Saturday, I forgot to put in the proper microphone. So I was talking into the native uh, microphone on the computer, and it sounded like I was underwater. People were nice about it, but... Yeah, I, I, ah. I, I was watching. I know a few of you said something, but most of you didn't. And thank you, because I didn't want to so, go in and get them to start another live stream. So, um, yeah, I think we try to avoid you. those problems. So before we get in, we've got a fantastic topic tonight. Uh, Tracy and I both really dove into this all day. And man, there's a, a lot of fascinating things to share with you. But before we do that, we want to mention one or two things, a couple of quick announcements. You want to do that? Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Why don't you do it? Because I'm about to cough, actually. Well, cough. <laughs> Come on, you can do sorry. it. Okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll just mention we have a new schedule yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. So if you were paying attention last week on Tuesday, you were expecting the two of us. And instead you had <laughs> a, a really awesome Richard Olin show where I interviewed Peter Davenport. That was actually a fabulous interview, mm -hmm. but it wasn't what you were expecting. And so- There's a reason for that. Right. We have changed our schedule and we just want to let you all know exactly what we're up to. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to do a live show every other week. Right. And we're going to release a Richard Dolan show. On YouTube every on other YouTube week. On YouTube in between every other week. So Tuesdays. Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock, there'll always be something new and fresh for you guys. Right. But we just wanted you to know that's how we're going to do it. And it could get a little dicey when we have a lot of conferences in a row. If we do some travel. Yeah, but but we'll see. Generally, that's what it's, it's not going to be too not too much of an issue. I think we're going to be coroned out of conferences for much of the year. I really think so. I think it's, it's it may be happening. So, which brings us to our next announcement. Uh, we were telling a lot of you that we were going to be in Seattle at a new kind of conference called Mind Gaming, uh, which is about creativity and innovation. We were excited about right. it, but uh, that conference has had to be postponed. It's, it was going to be in a few weeks. It's in Seattle in where Seattle. there's a lot of activity going on with the coronavirus. Yeah. I think there's just been a lot of concern, a lot of uh, people worrying about uh, traveling there. And so that has been postponed and yeah. it begins. So we'll just see how far this goes. But yeah, that will keep you posted as to when that will be rescheduled. Uh, and at the moment, we have Edinburgh, Texas uh, still going right. as far as we know. And that is April 4th. Mm -hmm. For those of you who live in the area, come out and see us. That's South, South Texas, really and close keep to your the eye on the Keep your eye. We'll, we'll announce, you know, as we find out. And you can all, even if you're not a member of richarddolanmembers.com, our website, you can always go there and announcements will be free to everyone to see. The calendar's there. The calendar's there, but also we ha we can do free posts, uh, free yeah. content posts. So we'll do that for, mm -hmm. for things like that. And uh, then we have Contact in the Desert the end of May, and then uh, Awakenings in June. So we'll see what happens. Right. We'll see what happens. If this turns into Stephen King's The Stand, you'll know as quickly as we do, and everything will be different. But other than that... I don't know that we'll... <laughs> Oh, wow. That was a good one. <laughs> we'll have a review on that one later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh... But um, anyway, yeah, that's kind so of far so on. good. We'll just see how it rolls from here on in. And then the only other thing is... Uh, you have a pretty cool interview lined up for this Friday. Very much looking forward to that. With Kathleen Martin. And right. a lot of you know Kathleen uh, from what her research is typically about, you know, with ab abductions and her and uh, Betty and Barney Hill. But this time, Richard's going to be interviewing her about something very different. Kathleen is really the, has dug in more than anyone else alive, I would say, into the legacy, if you can call it that of the UFO skeptic, Philip J. Class. Kathleen knows everything about this guy. And I'm gonna just say one thing in advance of that interview. If, if you're one of these uh, hardcore skeptics uh, who's like a professional in the organization, you have a lot to be ashamed of when it comes to the legacy of Philip J. Class. And Kathleen will make it very clear as to why she's not gonna hold anything back. 
Right. We were talking to her after one of the conferences we were at, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was telling us about her research. And we said, you have got to come on the show. Yeah. And you have got to share this information. So, so we'll have her um, on. I'm going to interview her this week. Be She'll be on next Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. But that will be the release Tuesday night next week. So lots to look forward to. Yep, definitely. So okay. anything I else? Think I just want to check that our, our microphone's OK. Yep. Sounds we're good. We're good. OK. okay. All right. Shall we get into Mr. Stringfield's Let's cases. Let's get into it. <laughs> I'm going to share the screen with you. Can I do that here? Yeah. So that is Leonard Stringfield. We've talked about him a number of times in the past on this very program. That's his uh, book in 1977, Situation Red. Leonard, I never met Leonard Stringfield. He died in 1994. It was the year that I really first came into the UFO field. But this is the book. I've got that very copy of Situation Red. Uh, it was a very important book. Uh, I was just rereading over a lot of it. And the thing about Stringfield, <laughs> he was a very, uh, he was a dignified man and a good researcher. We really need more of that in our world. Uh, but what really made this book unusual is about 10 pages toward the end of the book where he starts uh, in the chapter called Above Top Secret. I'm sorry, everyone. There you go. <laughs> Excuse me. This is let better out than in. I know. I'm sorry. It's bringing back memories from last year. Remember oh, that? remember that whole thing? Yeah. Get were. rid of it for a long time. I yeah. don't have a cough. I don't know what this is. It's fine. Well, we got water right there. Yeah. I say drink it. Here. Make use of it. Okay. Nature's bounty. It's right here. Hey, can I just sidetrack us for one second? Can you put that back up there for a sec? Put what? Show this book cover. Stringfield. Now, that was released what year? 77. Wasn't 77 around the time that uh, Star Wars was released? Because it really looks yeah, yeah. like... Uh, well, and also this, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's definitely got that look to it. Text. Yeah. They all came out the same period of time. Close Encounters, late 77. This book, same year. It's definitely got a Close Encounters look to it. I mean, let's yeah. let's face it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Oh, right, with the with Star the Wars, the, the scrolling text. Yeah. Absolutely. Although I couldn't remember when I was looking at it whether that came from... What, whether that was... Um, in Return of the Jedi, or it was in Star Wars as no, well. No, I think it was, it was the first Star one. Wars, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were they were working it, working yeah, it. That's a long time ago. So, what makes this book actually memorable? It, it's a fine book in general. It's actually <laughs> worth reading. It gives you a, a sense of where UFO researchers were at in the mid late seventies. But what actually made this book so important is about ten pages, ten pages, yeah, where he talks about crash retrieval stories of UFOs. And you need to put some perspective on this. UFO researchers in the late 70s were not talking about crash retrievals, like at all. Yeah, and he actually said that he wasn't really into it either. No. Uh, that, he, that he and a lot of other researchers would kind of scoff at yes. uh, anyone mentioning cra cash re uh, crash retrievals, mm -hmm. partially because of, um, Oh, his name Frank is Frank Scully's book. Yes, Frank Got Scully's it right here. book. Right. So can you tell the story of that? I want to. So um, I've got two ver two covers of this book. So this is the hardcover, kind of boring, very, almost looks academic. Frank Scully, Behind <laughs> the Flying Saucers. This is the 1950 imprint. Uh, it's actually a great book. Scully was a good writer. And to anyone who has not read this book in a while, I will simply recommend the author's uh, preface, which really gets into a, a, an analysis of what we would now call the deep state, but only he did it back in 1950. I mean, okay, not a, a serious deep analysis, but a pretty good analysis for that time. Hey, this is five, six years before C. Wright Mills wrote The Power Elite. Frank Scully had his finger on the pulse. Go check it out. But anyway, in this, this book, he uh, talks about, of course, what became known as the Aztec UFO crash, mm -hmm. which was uh, brutally smacked down and smeared uh, a couple of years later as a total hoax, which really wasn't. Go read Scott and Suzanne Ramsey on that. But well, here's... <clears throat> wasn't part of the problem that uh, one of the scientists who he used ended up being... Well, more than one person. Oh, it was so, more than one person yeah, who ended he had, up. He had a Dr. G in the book who was mm. a composite of, uh, there was a Leo Gebauer for real, and there were other people. And Scully did play a little fast and loose with that whole element of it. Right. But, uh, but partly it was simply, I think he wanted to keep anonymity. 
but the whole thing came out where they were trashed in this expose as uh, Silas Newton and Leo Gabauer were supposedly con men. Um, they weren't. I mean, they, they really were not the way that they were portrayed, but the whole thing just came crashing down. And the idea of crash retrievals of UFOs just went away mm -hmm. for more than a quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out, this is the, look at that cover. This is the same book, oh, wow. Spring of 51. Maybe that's why the book got uh, debunked. <laughs> look at that. Classic early 50s, end of the world cover. Um, you know, it doesn't look very academic, right? So let's right. just let's just put that right out there. But I was just going to say that uh, Stringfield also said that one of the reasons why he wasn't into crash retrievals and neither were other researchers were because not only the book and what happened with that, but also at the time uh, in the 50s, that's when the, the military was really coming out with these super strong denials. Absolutely. As well to accompany that. So Absolutely. they all kind of let that go, right? Yeah. Uh, look, Americans in the 1950s and 60s were default method was patriotic and believe, believe your right. military, believe your government. These are the guys who won the Second World War. So American citizens were very deferential to the military. And I think we can understand all of those historical reasons why. And that certainly factored into it. So it took time before this all came out. So originally, most of his book was sightings, abductions, and close encounters right. of all the different kinds. That's exactly right. Okay. And then at the very end, really 10 pages. Um, and what's, what's fascinating, actually, most of that was spent with uh, the, what became known as the Kingman, Arizona crash of 1953. And that is the testimony of Arthur Stansel to Raymond Fowler. We, we have talked about that. I've talked about that on... Uh, uh, on this live stream and um, elsewhere, uh, he he's got it in for ten pages in the, at the end uh, when Stansell's suit on him, Fritz Werner was what people were talking about. But he's got the Kingman crash in here, and keeping uh, some perspective on this, you know, when when Stringfield wrote this book, Stanton Friedman had not yet met Jesse Marcel, so Stanton wasn't doing crash retrievals either. Mm -hmm. Stringfield was diving into this, but it was Ray Fowler who in 1973, several years earlier than this, did his interview and got an affidavit from this man who talked all about the Kingman UFO crash. And when you really look at, in the big picture, that even more than, well, as much as Jesse Marcel was what kick-started the entire crash retrieval phenomenon. Maybe more so, uh, because Stringfield wrote about it here. And then once this book came out, the floodgates opened. And and that's what we're going to talk about here. We've got three cases of individuals who came to Stringfield in the aftermath of, of his publication of this book. And um, it's kind of an amazing story. You mm -hmm. know, we've, we've done this before. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, if I just may say this, um, I really believe that understanding the phenomenon of crashed UFOs or UAP really does get us to the heart of this phenomenon in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Stringfield believed it way back then, more than 40 plus mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And and it's not hard to see why, because it's one thing to say, we don't know what they are. You know, we hear this a lot these days. We don't know what they are. Maybe they're Russian technology. Maybe they're Chinese technology. But here's the thing. If you've actually recovered technology, <laughs> to say nothing of bodies, just tech alone, well, you can darn well figure out what you've got there, if it's from this civilization or not. Like if it's that mm -hmm. far advanced, you're gonna know that the Russians and Chinese are not quite going to be there. Right. And so it's really not that difficult. So crash retrievals is absolutely critical in understanding this phenomenon in a deep way and Stringfield, really took us a long way down that road. And it's it's kind of uh, a shame that he's really not that well appreciated. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. When you get into the stuff, you think, my gosh, you know, I really like <clears throat> the new stuff. We all really like the new stuff. But uh, there is so much amazing information here. And uh, it's it was really fascinating, refreshing on, um, 
reading some of his articles and refreshing right. on sort of how this all came about for him. You know, Richard was saying around the time of this book, which was which he wrote in 77, right. it only had 10 pages on crash retrievals. I was reading something that he wrote where he said, you know, the whole crash retrieval thing was dead. And then uh, right before he was about to release his book, all of a sudden, these new uh, really great sources started to emerge. Mm -hmm. Then he released the book and they were continuing. He started to do lectures. He did this lecture in July of uh, 1978. This is a year, year after, yeah. This is a year after at a MUFON conference uh, in Dayton, Ohio. I just want to put, have a map here. And um, this is actually a fascinating event. So Dayton, Ohio, Air, U.S. Air Force headquarters. And it's right there. It's right next to Cincinnati. And you go a little closer in. Uh, I label these nice and clear. Here's Ohio. <laughs> Dayton's here. Uh, whoops. Dayton is here. Cincinnati is here. You've got Kentucky. You've got Indiana. This whole region here in the central part of the United States. Uh, here's U.S. Air Force headquarters. Stringfield lived here his whole life. He lived really close by. So he was in contact with a lot of retired Air Force and other military people as well. And he had a major connection in his research to write Patterson Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of these stories come from. So that's where the conference was in 1978 in Dayton, Ohio, right in the belly of the beast. That's right. It was a MUFON conference. And uh, he says this was actually kind of a turning point for him because he was doing a lecture um, called Retrievals of the Third Kind, a case mm -hmm. study of alleged UFOs and their occupants in military custody. Right. Um, and when he did this, apparently there were two threats on his life. He didn't know about them because they, they went through someone else. So he just went up and did his lecture, uh, his two hour lecture, you know, not really concerned about that. that that's him doing it. That's yeah. a, a photograph from 1978 at right. Stringfield on the stage, giving that exact lecture that you're talking right. about. So not only did he have these threats on his life, he also was whisked away immediately as soon as it was over by people who were armed, had walkie talkies and were in plain clothes and they took him to a press conference and then they whisked him back to the hotel and he wasn't even allowed to stay in his own room. They, they switched rooms on him. They left him in this place. They told him, you can't talk to anybody. You can't leave. Can you imagine? This is just a UFO conference and you've got this armed security. Um, Escorting you. you away, whisk, yeah, yeah he, the way he describes it, you know, it sounds like it was a, you know, they really sort of whisked him away really quickly. But so they left him in this room. He wasn't allowed to leave. And um, he also missed all of the appointments with the sources that he had lined up for, right. for after his lecture, right? But he said it, it made him realize that he'd really touched into a hot spot. Right. That, that, that this... That was is, like his moment this where he was realized, his moment. Uh, I've got to continue. I think he was really kind of getting in deeper. But yeah, that was like his crystallizing moment where yeah. he was like, I'm on to something. I want to point out something. They had that conference in Dayton, Ohio in 1978. Of all of the past MUFON conferences, if I could have time traveled back, I think I would pick that one. Yeah, I think that would be great. Uh, <laughs> aside from the fact that you've got Stringfield's lecture there, yeah. uh, I want to get to that at the end, but they had Donald Kehoe, they had uh, Alan Hynek, they had Hynek's wife, Mimi. Uh, they had, you know, who's they're all famous now on the show, Blue Book. <laughs> yeah. uh, Richard Hall, who... Um, was very important in MUFON back in those days. Uh, Walter Andres and um, Isabel Davis, a lot of these old time names that mean something to me. I, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have gone back there and just seen yeah. these people. But Stringfield really was the hero of that conference. And I, I don't use that word lightly. This is a man, they go in to have a, a conference in Dayton, Ohio, right next to the US Air Force headquarters. And here is Stringfield and he gives 17 cases, 17 cases of crash retrieval of UFOs mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And so they had planned the press conference for after his lecture. And that press conference was kind of a big deal. He goes in to talk about the fact that the US military had crashed, had retrieved crash UFOs. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very hostile press conference. Uh, the only reason I know that is because in the 
uh, I've got the MUFON journal here from that month and Richard Hall's writing about it and he's describing how hostile it was and how Stringfield kept his composure throughout. So it was really kind of an amazing thing. Um, so that's, that's something, that's a heroic thing, in my opinion, for like a UFO researcher to do that. That's about as good as it gets, in my view. Mm -hmm. You're going right into the heart of the secret keepers. You're, you're throwing it down. You're mm -hmm. throwing down the evidence, mm -hmm. 17 cases. Mm -hmm. And, and Stringfield, uh, one other thing I just want to point out about this man, he was so measured. I just want to, this is uh, one of his statements here. He says, um, I am not in a providential position to pass a positive or final judgment on the retrieval stories or on my informants. On this tenuous ground, I must allow for some marginal error in observation or a tiny flaw in human judgment for each reported account. However, let me quote an old adage, wherever there is smoke, there is fire. And from my position, he says, I certainly can see a hell of a lot of smoke. <laughs> right. So that's Stringfield. He just had a good way of putting those things and um, he had a lot of class in doing it. So can we jump into uh, three of the cases in some depth? Yes, just wanna do two things first. Yeah. One for people who don't know, a lot of people who are, who are here have been into this for a long time, but there are a lot of people who are new. And so this is retrievals of the third kind. Right? This is what, that was his phrase. I mean, this yeah. goes from Ellen Hynek's close encounters of the first kind, of the second kind, and of the third kind. That was his typology of it. Yeah. And Stringfield took that and he talked about crash retrievals of the third kind. So yeah, so let's just go over what he's talking about for some people who might not know what that means. Like that, that means craft and beings and bodies that right. have been recovered, have that's been retrieved. Right. So that is what he's interested in craft and beings. And that's why these cases are so fascinating. They absolutely, but not only that, he classified them in two different ways. He has his a, his a class and his B class, his a class are uh, first hand accounts. Mm -hmm. And he wanted them from very, very high level military personnel, right. intelligence, uh, high level medical, uh, I'm leaving someone out, uh, uh, well, we can say prestigious, yeah. high-level professional individuals. Yeah, pilots, engineers, right. these type of people, people who held high-level um, positions, and people who saw craft and or beings firsthand themselves. That was always his goal. Mm -hmm. The B class was uh, um, one level removed. Like a spouse or a colleague, that type of thing. Right. So the ones mm -hmm. we're going to go over today are uh, three A class where he actually got, yeah, that's they're right. all A class. One started out as a B class and then graduated to an A class. It did. That's right, he got, he got to the original person at the end of his investigation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they're, they're really good, he, these are good people. Of the three that we're gonna do, one of them is the last one. When I look at it, I think if I had any skepticism, it would be on that last one. Although I don't think that I'm skeptical of it, and I don't think Stringfield was, so I have to respect his judgment mm -hmm. on it, but we'll, we'll mm -hmm. talk about that mm -hmm. and I'll give you my reasons why I'm, mm -hmm. wasn't a hundred percent sure about it, but mm -hmm. I think I basically did believe it. So the first two I think are very easy to believe. I absolutely agree. And the yeah. third one we can all, we can all listen to and see what we'll we think. discuss. And yeah. I think it would be a good idea to come back to these, you know, Stringfield did these uh, various, what he called, uh, uh, status reports. This is this is the one we're working tonight. Status report number two. There were uh, seven of them. We've got them all, and we'll be going through all of them, probably at some point or another. Um, so, get we started. Do you want? Yeah, to I just want to add in something about the B class. Um, he also felt those were very important because they, there was always a chance they were going to start to corroborate with the A class. Right. They were going to corroborate each other. Right. So they're. They're all important, yeah. but uh, you know we all want the A class, right? <laughs> well, absolutely. So let's go for it. Well, so we'll just, um, I'll just start. So after, uh, around the time his book came out, but long before the MUFON Symposium, he's speaking, um, this is in the summer of 1977, so it's around the time of the publication of his book. Uh, and he's in Cincinnati is where he lives. And uh, this is an interesting one. He's speaking at a, a World Wings gathering. This is an aviation thing. Um, 
for an audience, a small audience of pilots. Right. He said about 25 yeah. pilots were in the audience here. So he's talking about UFOs. He's talking about his current research. One of the pilots during the Q&A brings up the phenomenon of crash retrievals of UFOs. It was Stringfield. This pilot did. Mm -hmm. So uh, they chat about this. And then after the event, they meet mm -hmm. privately. Mm -hmm. And that's when the pilot, they're standing in front of a large topographical map of the United States. And the pilot says, I have seen the bodies. He says, I have seen the bodies. It was in a desert area. And he's pointing roughly to Arizona. It was in a desert area, but I don't know the exact location. I'm almost positive it was in 1953. So that's interesting. And he goes on. There's another quote here. I saw the bodies at Wright Patterson. Right. So right where they were. I was in the right place at the right time when the crates arrived at night by DC-7. So that's that's the pilot story. So basically what happened though is a little bit of more detail here. He gets to the, there's a hangar. I don't think he said which hangar it was, but he's inside yeah, he the didn't. hangar, right? At least that wasn't reported. Right. Yeah. He's inside the hangar where this was and he's about 12 feet away from a forklift. So yeah. visualize 12 feet. It's not that far. And is a forklift with five, hastily constructed wooden crates. At least he surmised that they were hastily constructed. Um, in three of the crates, he saw uh, what were alien bodies. Back in the 70s, the phrase everyone was using was humanoid. They weren't really, they were saying alien, but they were really saying humanoid. They were humanoid bodies um, in three crates, I assume one body per crate. I don't really know. He didn't really make that clear. Uh, they were about four feet tall. In fact, I've got a, uh, a little bullet point list here. You can just read through this. Uh, four feet tall. They were, tall. They were lying uncovered um, on top of a fabric that mm -hmm. he believed was protecting them because below them was dry, dry ice. Yeah. So th to prevent them from getting freezer burn, apparently. Um, it was packed in there. There was uh, air police uh, standing guard all around. Mm -hmm. And so he, he it's not like he could go in and stare right. at this thing. But he said to Strangfield, I got a good look at this. It was fast, but it was good. And he noticed that. Um, Weren't they wearing something? Yes. In fact, uh, let me stop sharing the screen here. Yeah, they were wearing a uh, tight fitting clothing. Yeah. It was dark. Yeah. I, I have Navy in my mind. I don't know if I read that or. Uh, you might've inferred that. I'm not sure if I remembered Navy, okay. but one thing that he did say, this is a, another drawing that not from this witness, but I wanted to include it here. This is from another string field. This is a composite from other witnesses that he had. And I don't think this was outrageously different than what this witness was describing. He said hairless heads, kind of like slits for eyes, a nose that you could barely see, mm -hmm. a very tiny mouth. Uh, you know, your classic description of, of uh, an alien being. It's not exactly uh, the way we would describe gray aliens today mm -hmm. with the ultra pointed chin. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, this guy, I don't know how close he really was or how long it was. You got a decent look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've got that. One of the things, do you remember that he said one he thought was a female? Yeah. Did you remember yeah, that? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Did you want to discuss that or? Uh, he just, uh, by the shape of the body, there was one. He, he, that, thought he saw breasts. Well, he just said it, it had a protruding chest. Right. And so, you know, he's concluding it was a female. And, you know, when Richard and I were going over this case, we looked at each other and said, you know, I, I've never heard that in a case. No, you don't really hear much. I mean, typically with these, with alien beings, they're almost, they seem gender neutral. You don't right. really get a sense of gender, but uh, that's the sense that he got. So they're definitely like biological, not just Android necessarily. They mm -hmm. were, 
a biological male female. Well, he said it was either that or it had um, a very muscular yeah, chest. Yeah, a very muscular chest. So one of the two. But he seemed to think it was female. And then later, you can tell about what well, happened later. He spoke, right. He spoke to a, a, a colleague of his, actually someone I think he shared his a room with, Bunk yeah. Room, mm -hmm. who did say to him, no, of, of them, one of them was a female. Yeah. So for what it's worth, it's odd, right? But I mean, there you go. One of the things that people would say is, well, why would, you know, military people talk? This is supposed to be top secret. My my feeling is, you can keep in mind, this is 1953. This is not 2020. Mm -hmm. Like in our own era, I mean, we're, we're now in a situation where secrecy protocols are a given. And it's right. not that they weren't in the 50s. Right. But it seems to me that there is often a bit more wiggle room among people. Uh, soldiers who were friends right. uh, at least this is the sense that i get when i go back to these old accounts so uh it seems to me that it's not impossible to imagine that he'd have gotten that information from his mm -hmm. from his buddy and then uh one thing that's nice about stringfield is he really sort of gives you an idea of what the person was like that he was talking to right so uh he this, I think he said that this particular person was very, seemed very in control, very matter of fact, very, mm -hmm. um, there was something about his, the way he was mm -hmm. telling this that just really um, seemed extremely authentic to him. And uh, so he, he believed him. Yeah. And the the way he approached him, the way he said the things that he did, and the way that he shared these things. So right. he considered him a uh, very he credible did. subject. Yeah. Yeah. All, all of these three that we're yeah. going over, he really did. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that he he got from um, the source got from his contact was that he heard that one of the entities was alive, yeah. uh, at least alive when they got to it. Yeah. Uh, when the U.S. military arrived, uh, they tried to save its life with oxygen, but it, it died. Right. Now, I mean, this really makes me think, was this the Kingman, Arizona crash? It seems like it really could have been. Hmm. Um, we, we don't really know for sure, but mm -hmm. it would not be, I mean, it, it obviously fits. So mm -hmm. you've got 1953, you've got Arizona, you've got the desert, mm -hmm. um, you've got bodies. Um, yeah, the guy, the one other thing about him, uh, let me just share this uh, screen here again. It says a couple of bullet points. Um, yeah, he said, oh, right, the skin looked brown in the lighting, but it was hard to tell. Um, large heads, tight fitting dark suits, uh, one appeared to be female, which we kind of mentioned. And um, so we got that whole thing. And then he also, just in talking to Stringfield, this is just other stuff. This is a guy who had a top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. um, he had a very good career, apparently. He claimed that he had heard about, this is during World War II, a Foo Fighter, that is a UFO, being retrieved in England yeah. by the U.S. 8th Air Force. So that's interesting. And you don't really hear much about that mm -hmm. in terms of crash retrievals, but Stringfield got that story. Uh, the man also just said he had seen photos at Wright Pat of a retrieved UFO and a close-up showing strange glyphs on it, mm. which looked like Sanskrit. On our own website, I just want to point out, we do Q and A's, and one of the Q and A sessions had to do with uh, evidence of alien writing and where that was. And I didn't think of this one. I didn't know, um, it didn't occur to me that there was this evidence of something that looked like Sanskrit uh, right. that came to Stringfield uh, from a crash retrieval case. So that's interesting. And then the last thing this man said is that in, um, oh, this, this is interesting. So Stringfield was working this guy for a year or more. And he says, look, can I get uh, a statement from you? Can I get uh, like some kind of affidavit? Can I record you in one way or another? And the guy says, look, I've got a security. Oh, I can't break it. Right. Uh, eventually Stringfield says, can I get a posthumous statement from you? Yeah. Like, good question. Like, yeah, right. It's good that he's asking those questions. But. So the guy says, let me talk to my security officer. Yeah. And after a long <laughs> response, you can imagine he gets the answer from the security officer. And this is what he tells Stringfield that the security officer says to him, you have seen nothing, heard nothing, 
and you sure as shit can sign nothing. So that's the, um, that was a security officer t- talking to Stringfield's source. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much the end of that story. Yeah. One thing that was, uh, or another thing that was cool about Stringfield is he, um, he stayed in touch with these people and he would <clears> sometimes, <throat> you know, he would ask them all these questions, but he right. would actually go back a year <clears throat> later and ask them the same questions. Yes, so, he did. He did a lot of follow-up. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> He caught a lot of uh, criticism at the time from some other UFO researchers. It's kind of like the situation that you find uh, researchers are often in today, to be perfectly honest. Like, you know, you get a source and you you don't, you can't give these people up. Yeah. Like Stringfield just couldn't give them up. So they came to him under some very severe uh, conditions of like, you must not mention my name and so on. Uh, so they give him the story and then he puts these out and there were quite a few researchers in the seventies who said, this is a lot of mal- baloney. Like we have no way of knowing mm-hmm. if this is, if someone's just pulling your leg or not. And it is t- it's tough, you know, but as Stringfield said, he was seeing a hell of a lot of smoke. Right. So it was, and a lot of the way th- these cases came to him, it was very clear that it was through often very circuitous indirect routes Mm-hmm. And he would they'd come across another one and come across another one and another one. So there is definitely a very def, a, a real pattern mm-hmm. with all of these. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do you want to move on? Should we move on to the next one? Or? Yes. Something came to my mind and it's gone. So let's go to the well, next one. It back, it'll come back. Just jump we'll right in. It again. Um, so this is another one he calls case A2. The first one was A1. Uh, this started out as he was talking to, I guess, a second-hand witness, which then became a first-hand witness. It started out as right. talking to the wife right. of someone, and then he ended up getting getting the guy himself. But this was the wife initially of a U.S. Air Force uh, sergeant. His name was Carl. He was an air policeman. So we knew all of that. Mm-hmm. Stringfield knew all of that. And this is another 1977, mm-hmm. uh, August of 77, where he, he talks with her. Uh, basic story. And he talks with her multiple times. She's another one of these That's people. Right. He talks to her over and over. And when, every time he does, he tries to see if he can talk to Carl. Right. And every he time. wants to have that first hand confirmation. Right. And, and Carl's like, Nope, not going to do it. Yeah. Won't do it. But he could hear it. him in the background sometimes, but Nope, he still wouldn't do on, it. On a phone call. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, actually I've got a slide on that one. Okay. So, uh, cause he's got a really interesting quote there. Yeah. Uh, but the story is it starts in 1973, so not that much before. I mean, he's talking to her in 77. Uh, Carl is called to duty in, sometime in the night. He's driven. Yeah. They blindfold him. Uh, they take him across a field of wet grass. Mm-hmm. He's helped down a flight of stairs, all blindfolded, then through this long hallway. And then eventually they stop and the blindfold comes off and he's uh, in this amazing place. He's given instructions. He's like, this is where you're going to stand guard. And once it all sinks in, well, he sees a room of very high ranking officers and plain clothes specialists. And they're looking at three small alien bodies on a table. Uh, they were dead and they're on this table and he describes them. In fact, let me just share this bullet point here. Uh, this is another drawing that uh, I think Stringfield did this drawing. This is another composite. This was not uh, exactly what Carl said, but it's pretty close. Uh, bald head, the slits, the, the thin eyes and the tiny nose and mouth and so forth. So I just thought I'd put that in there so you could get an idea. These are the types of, um, description Stringfield was getting mm-hmm. regularly. Mm-hmm. Three feet tall, big heads. Um, this was interesting to me. Did, did this strike you as interesting? They seem to have short fuzz. Yeah, it did. On the top, top of, their, of heads. their heads. I just think I really found that interesting. Yeah. You know, because that's not something someone's just going to put in there willy nilly. Like who's going to think of that if you're making up a story? Yeah. A little fuzz on top of the head. Right. So now when you hear descriptions of greys or other types of aliens, you almost never 
hair hair of hair except if they're humanoid type like human looking but this these were apparently not but there was a kind of a fuzz maybe with hybrids maybe. Uh, but these you know maybe that's what that was but he stated that he detected fuzz on the top of the head which i just want to which case was it where he was talking about this the quality of the skin Maybe I was reading a different case. It wasn't. You might have been reading a different case. Okay. We didn't it talk about this beforehand, okay. so okay, that will remember. be in an upcoming one. Then we'll we'll get into it. Yeah. Uh, skin color, off white or cream. Um, think about the skin color. Like you, you can't take those exactly clear because these are dead bodies, and you don't know if they're in a state of decomposition or damage. You don't know what the lighting is like. They could look different under different lighting conditions. I could imagine. Yeah. You know? The the picture that I painted in my head for the first one that we just went over. I, um, I, I think he said it was sort of, uh, I had gymnasium lighting in my head. He said something about the he did, lighting, yeah. that that's what my right. mind created as a picture. That room had pretty good lighting from the way he described yeah. it. But even but so. That sort of fluorescent yeah. lighting. So yeah, it would look different for sure in the different conditions. Apparently this really shook him up. Why wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. This is what he told his wife. And uh, there was an interesting thing that she told uh stringfield about it do you remember this statement here she says i believe he was dramatically affected one time he told his sister about it and she just laughed yeah. since then he refuses to discuss the matter with anyone even me so yeah he just got kind of shut down by it at that time but stringfield didn't give up this is I know you uh oh then let me get to the phone call isn't that the uh yeah, so Stringfield calls. Do you want to discuss this? You were well, I don't know, because he, he called a couple times, as I was saying, right. where he was talking to his wife. And are you talking about the time where he could hear him in the background? Yeah, exactly. He could hear Carl in the background sitting at the coffee table. And uh, so he asked her if uh, he could talk to Carl. And she she said no. And but it happened a couple of times, so right. I'm not sure which which time you're talking about. If well, on this time. one occasion, but basically, yeah. she was saying he's sort of emotionally he's he's emotionally shut down. Like he he's this was it's too emotional for him to talk about, and he doesn't right. want to talk. Exactly. Uh, here at this one point, Stringfield's doing uh, back and forth through the wife, trying to get Carl to talk, and she just said he said he's not allowed to talk about it and that he will tell everything he knows oh, after yes. President Carter makes right. an announcement. Right, right, right. And that's another significant yeah. element because we're talking late 70s. Jimmy Carter becomes president in January of 1977. He was the first presidential candidate to campaign and to tell people that he had seen a UFO. Uh, now, he didn't say that he knew it was alien. He just said, yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, it was at a Lions Club meeting. He was governor of Georgia back in at that time. He even filled out a report for NICAP. And so he was a witness. And in the buildup during Carter's run for the White House and then his early months as president was, it, he got thousands and thousands of letters from citizens about UFOs after he became president. Mailbags after mailbag. People really believed that Jimmy Carter just might be the disclosure president back in 1977. It's easy to forget this, but it's absolutely the case. Of course, it didn't happen. How disappointing. Um, it's been so whole, long. Wow. It's a whole, I wrote about that in actually one of my books and yeah. it's a, it's a interesting and sad story, but he clearly got shut down um, if he intended to do it at all. But he did say as a candidate, like if I'm elected, I'll open up the blue book files. And if there's anything I can let out that doesn't damage national security, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. And so this man, Stringfield's guy, Carl, is right thinking well if the president makes an announcement i'm going to come I'll talk. all out with it yeah but uh that of course didn't happen now finally stringfield did reach carl he did talk to the wife he's like when can i get him when's a good time mm -hmm. and she helped him out a little bit she absolutely did yeah, Told she him when was, he would be when he would be at work so he he was uh, she, he was also able to contact him at work at work during his lunch break interesting yeah a coffee break yeah so he gets him yeah he gets him and they're talking and Stringfield just says, look, right away, like I told him what I was calling about. Uh, I, he said, I cited some strong data uh, from other sources, mm -hmm. really uh, relative to his experience, yeah. he said, and assured him that 
his identity would never be disclosed and, and all of this. And he says, after a long silence, Carl, with seeming reluctance, he said, mm -hmm. confirmed his experience and described the scene that he witnessed while on guard duty. And he, he basically he said the information was very consistent with what the wife yeah. had already said. Yeah. But he, he said the facial characteristics of the three were all very similar and that the skin, he said, was the same color as a drowned cadaver just brought out of the water. It's kind of a gruesome image, but you can kind of get that sense of like a, a dead, dull, grayish, mm -hmm. maybe even a bluish uh, tint to it. And then uh, Stringfield, I guess, probed a little bit more. Yeah. It's like, uh, and, and Carl said about that in a very low voice, this statement here, he said, I was shocked, I'd rather forget it. Right. And, and that's all he would really say about it to Stringfield. So he added just something small about the physical description to correct him. Right. And to, to add in a little yeah. more detail, but not really. And then, and then that. So, I mean, you definitely have witnesses here and he makes a point of saying this in articles that he writes that, you know, these people have no interest in being involved in UFO research. They have no interest in being right. involved. And that was Carl's case. Whatsoever. For sure. And so you see that here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, all of them want to be anonymous. All of them had clearances and he was, uh, you know, um, he definitely was keeping their names and their anonymity out of it or keeping the anonymity and keeping their right. names out of it. I, I mean, think it helped that Stringfield himself had served in the military. He was a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it allowed him to sort of get an in mm -hmm. with a lot of these guys mm -hmm. who had had the experience. They could say, okay, you're a fellow, yeah. uh, you know, part member of the military. So I will respect you and I'll talk to you. I, I really think that that did help him mm -hmm. quite a bit in uh, during this whole thing. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, he also writes about his frustrations, which I know, you know, a lot of researchers share like you and like Linda Moulton Howe, that you have a lot of these sources, but you also have a lot of backstory and information, you know, going on that you cannot bring forward. So he's only bringing forward the tip of the iceberg, the things that he can talk about. Right. It was very frustrating for him not to be able to bring all of the information available to sort of help build the overall mosaic for the UFO field. But yeah. this is just the nature of what happens. It is indeed. Um, you, you're, you're stuck. Sometimes yeah. you're just absolutely stuck. Like you'll get someone who will come to you. They've got an amazing story. You believe them. You check their bona fides to the best of your ability. You're mm -hmm. satisfied that they are who they say they are, and you've got a you've got a great story, but they it cannot be revealed. Mm -hmm. Like their identity cannot be revealed. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you have to be careful about what about their their account can be revealed because if you reveal everything, then it can be traced back to them. So it's it's a tricky game and it's annoying. And we you know you wish we didn't have to do it, but uh, for those people who are wondering, we'll just tell it all. You got to understand uh, if a researcher starts throwing everyone under the bus, they don't get anyone coming to them. And, you know, you make a promise to someone like, like they'll talk to you on this condition and, and you really don't want to break that. Mm -hmm. And Stringfield never did. Right. He, he really kept his word. One, one little aftermath of this story, by the way, um, he, um, Carl himself never really had any information on how the crash retrieval process worked. I mean, he was just doing guard duty. Um, but Stringfield, um, you know, was trying to follow up on these types of events. And so he's got a 1973 crash retrieval. That's what this seems like. And he had this contact who was an intelligence officer, uh, about, and he asked him about this 1973 case and, and Stringfield wrote, all I got from him was quote, no comment. So it wasn't a denial. It wasn't a confirmation. It was just a no comment. So. And Sound now we come familiar to, from uh, recent. I got I got some very good note comments <laughs> from individuals. You, on, you uh, did in 2019. I sure did. You did. So we have one case to go here. Uh huh. Uh, and this is the one. So I think we agree. Is this like a little bit more dicey or not? What What do you think about um, this? Um, I think we both had the same reaction to the first two. Uh, when you read them yourself, I mean, obviously it will be different than us telling the story, but. Uh, they just sounded very solid in the way he talked about the people did. Uh, right. This one, 
is this one's got a lot large like, scale it's big you'll see but let, let's talk about it and you know you get a sense of the people coming to Stringfield here uh the thing that i like about this one though is it came to Stringfield through his son-in-law yeah who was a uh, an assistant professor at a college down in Florida mm -hmm. at the time. And so it was his son-in-law who had actually met this guy first. And this guy was a former intelligence officer with the army, mm -hmm. not the air force, yep. U S army, yep. but who had claimed that he had seen alien bodies at Wright Patterson air force base in 1966. So he was with the army, but he was at Wright Pat in 66 and saw alien bodies, not three, but, Nine. nine nine alien bodies um and he you know straight field <laughs> yeah. but wait there's more there's much more um let me do the bullet uh, i'll just uh, bullet points here we got a, some of them so he was former army intel saw nine dead alien bodies preserved in a uh, deep freeze under a well-lighted uh thick glass enclosure that's how we at right patterson they were maybe four feet tall so they're pretty short they were grayish in their skin tone um they uh, the whole area was heavily guarded inside and out and and he tells stringfield that what he was told while he was viewing the bodies he was allowed to view the bodies mm -hmm. he was an army intelligence officer for That's whatever right. reason he was allowed to look at these bodies and he said that he was told that there were 30 bodies i don't know if that included the nine or not but that there were 30 bodies in total at or, Wright or at Wright patterson mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. at the base but there's even more than that so let's go a little and more no we don't have any pictures I, you know what i forget of the three cases which right. one was the one that talked about um um that they were in sort of refrigeration or they were that was another one. We actually, I think we discussed that one in one of right. our previous- This is the problem when uh, we read too tables. many of them. <laughs> right. But the, well, the theme of refrigeration though keeps coming up. Yeah. So it, it actually does happen quite a bit. But anyway, we'll continue. So um, he said that he did not see any alien craft stored there, but that he had heard, uh, was told that there were such craft. So I think multiple flying saucers or discs, alien discs at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Moreover, that there was an alien craft at uh, other places, including Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Right. Um, that's near DC, that's near CIA headquarters. Um, and another at McDill Air Force Base in Florida. And furthermore, he says he knew of three key areas, this is back in the 60s, when certain secret UFO research operations were conducted other than at Wright Pat. So Wright Pat, yes, but then other places as well. And he mentioned Langley Air Force Base again. He mentioned McDill. This is part of McDill, the Avon bombing range, uh, part of the McDill complex near Sebring, Florida. Uh, I don't know how close it is to Sebring, but uh, I know that it wasn't that far from where I lived in um, St. Near, Petersburg, near, Florida. Yeah, well, I think this is part of a McDill connected to McDill, but it was near Seabrook. Right, okay. So, and then another at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. So they were all identified as very significant uh, with UFO research. And then he, he gets into uh, a connection with, perhaps you could say Operation Project Moondust. He says a certain military bases, highly trained, mobilized oh, yeah. units were in a constant state of readiness to go anywhere to recover downed UFOs. Uh, and he identified them as blue berets. Now, there's right. always been this debate, like, do blue berets really exist or not? Uh, he says they were skilled in not just retrieving UFOs, but keeping the public uh, out of uh, out of commission in terms of getting in the way, including being able to cause power blackouts. Uh, Project Moondust is something that we know about. Uh, UFO researchers are able to get some documents describing these were three-man teams basically sent to recover foreign uh, space objects that could be Russian satellites. But one yeah. of the things in the moon dust uh, document is unidentified flying objects. So as distinct from Soviet tech. So you could 
actually really legitimately argue that moon dust was a UFO retrieval operation. And here you've got this witness coming to Stringfield saying, yep, absolutely. Wow. They were the blue berets. He has a little bit more to say. Let's just go into it. Um, this is where it gets a little crazy to me. Like everything up till now, I'm thinking, uh, and maybe what he says here is actually true, but it just gets really intense. He says, uh, from a, a two-year period, from 66 to 68, in the tri-state area of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, it's very near Cincinnati, basically, mm -hmm. he said he knew of personally of five UFO crashes. Five. And I just, I'm... I don't know. It kind of shocked me, uh, you know, to read that again. Uh, and he said in one of those incidents, uh, three bodies were recovered. Okay. Uh, but then he says during that incident, Stringfield calls it an alleged incident. So he's a little bit careful. Um, the guy says that there was a skirmish, like a, a firefight right. with alien forces by U.S. military units. Um, it's because apparently the U.S. forces didn't know what these aliens were intending to do. Mm -hmm. He wrote, he said, hostility was presumed. That's the quote from Stringfield's source. And then the last thing, I, I just found that really kind of uh, extreme, but impossible. I, I would say not impossible, just a bit extreme. Well, a lot is, you know? it would seem a lot has been kept from us for a long time. So we think it seems like a lot, but. I, I Yeah, yeah. I think it's entirely possible. We don't know, but. Willis, if we're kept, all of us, all right, there's a big, big infrastructure out there and it's kept from all of us. And we are really, truly kept in this kind of child's mental world yeah. uh, where there's so much important stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And it's not just with UFOs, you know, it's with, with everything. It's with everything. <laughs> but it is, it is definitely with UFOs. And so we... We have to understand that we don't know. We don't have an idea of just mm -hmm. how intense that reality is that's being hidden from us mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking with Peter uh, Davenport uh, last week. <clears throat> you know, he runs the National UFO Reporting Center, and he's he's saying of the five 6,000 reports he gets every year, he said that he believes that the number of witnesses is actually oh, yeah. thousands of times more than that. Right. Thou not, not hundreds. He actually said 10, 10 or 20,000. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. said, come on, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Now, that's not 20,000 more uh, UFOs, but 20,000 more witnesses. Right. And then he said, well, okay, maybe 10,000. <laughs> I'm like, wow, maybe. So we're talking millions of witnesses. So, And I'm not going to argue against Peter Davenport. He believes that this is such a massive widespread phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let's just say for a moment that it is. So there's this huge reality that is being kept from us. And, um, you know, people think, well, how is that possible? Well, look around you. I mean, you've got a, you've got a global media situation that is so utterly corrupt now. It is so beyond the pale. Uh, it really does keep people in a kind of mental world fit for kids. And, but, you know, we're adults. We're, we're not kids. And so it's a very controlled system. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to add to yeah. your point about, or his point about 10,000 people, yeah. he gave an example of where that kind of data comes from. He said, you know, you, cause you said he's an expert in Phoenix lights. He talked about yes, that yes. in the interview and Phoenix lights was a perfect example, you know, because they, they know right, right. that a very tiny sliver of people actually reported it where That's thousands right. of people, thousands right. and thousands of people saw it. It was there for so many hours in the sky. Correct. So, um, you yeah. know, this and is all through the state of Arizona as well, and even north, uh, southern Nevada. Yeah. So there were lots of witnesses. Mm -hmm. It was in the sky for a total of five hours or something like that. Yeah, right? that's right. That's what right. I said. So, um, yeah. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, all the people that are not reporting. So, so yeah. Let's do the last quote uh, from this guy to Stringfield since this is case number three here. Yeah. And his last point. He just yeah, says, yeah. since 1948, secret information concerning UFO activity involving the US military has been contained in a computer center at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. At this base, a master uh, a master computer file is maintained with duplicate support backup files secreted at other military installations. Get the computer dump file, he called it, 
both the master and the support backup files, and you've got all the hidden UFO data. That was his last statement to uh, Stringfield on that whole thing. So, so whether people, fascinating. Whether people believe his or not, um, this does keep coming back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, doesn't it? As far as uh, yes, absolutely. different uh, first-hand witnesses saying that there are bodies. Yeah, and there was one last bit of corroboration mm -hmm. that Stringfield had with this guy, by the way. Okay. Um, he went back down to a Dade City, Florida, where he had met with him before, mm -hmm. and he didn't get to meet with him in person this time. I don't know what happened, but he's doing a lecture down there, and he meets another guy who comes up to him and said, I was a, I'm a former Blue Beret. So he's telling yeah, Stringfield, right. like, to confirm this element. Now, the only thing that you could say is, well, he didn't meet the first guy. Was this some kind of weird setup? It seems convoluted to me, maybe not impossible, but again, um, I'm inclined to trust Stringfield's judgment on this. He knew, he knew the guy that he was talking to. He had multiple conversations with him. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's, I'm inclined to accept it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, blueberries, there's this debate, like were they, did they exist as a UFO retrieval team, team or not? Mm -hmm. And I think Stringfield's saying they did. And mm. you've got this, this bit of evidence. We know he was careful as well because he was talking about, how, you know, this, this big mistake of Frank Scully's. You know, all the researchers were trying to be extra careful yes. after that all happened. That Absolutely. they weren't doing any sort of sloppy research. That they were doing all of the due diligence that they could to confirm these people, corroborate their stories. Uh, it was. This is really the... Them reaction against this book <laughs> this yeah. this crazy goofy uh 1950s cover of what's actually a good book uh not a perfect book scully couldn't get all the information if you really want the information on the aztec ufo crash you've got to go to scott and suzanne ramsey uh, their work on this is as definitive as any human being could get at this point they really got it here's one last picture i have of stringfield i think we actually did uh we did a show on that, right? We did. A we, show on we did. Aztec and yeah. Yeah, we talked about the Ramses. They're wonderful people too. Uh, that's Stringfield um, in his later years. He's always just strikes you as as this decent, genuinely good man, a true gentleman, and a smart man, a good researcher. Um, so that's Leonard Stringfield at some point later, later in his years. He made it to 1994. That was the first full-time year that I had in throwing myself into UFOs. So he um, he passed away as I was just diving in. He is one of those those people I would have just loved to have spent some time with mm -hmm. and really gotten to a know. And I think I, think I would have loved mm -hmm. um, knowing that man. Mm -hmm. uh, just everything about him seemed like he was um, smart, brave, and good. Mm -hmm. And what more do you want? Mm-hmm. And, and his 1978 MUFON, that's like borderline heroic right there, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, when you start going back into these researchers, sort of the first era, right? Yeah. Of the UFO researchers and uh, just how seriously they took it. And they also had, uh, you know, there was NICAP, and later there was APRO. There were all these different organizations. Right. But you know, in, in going through the articles and, and reading the tone, everybody took this so very seriously. They had volunteers dedicated to doing things all over. The, it's it's quite yes. different. Now, they felt a little isolated then. But when you read this and you compare it to now, I feel like researchers are a little more isolated now. That's interesting. Except for conferences. That's interesting. Because it seemed to me they had all these volunteers uh, who were doing phone calls and this and that. And they had, yeah. they had uh, I, I can't remember what the name is, but they had, they're sort of essentially like scouts at the Air Force bases that were well, allowed to be there and reporting into their sort of central station. I mean. Yeah, I think maybe you're right. We're, we're getting our own little team of uh, some really good people around us. And I'm kind of happy about that. So we've got some good people that we do communicate with it's on true. a regular basis now. Our own little but, version of it. But, but it, it's tough. Yeah. One thing I wanted to point out um, while I'm thinking of this is when you really consider how strange the, the, this whole phenomenon is, and it is strange, right? So just imagine the, the journey, the mental journey that people in the 50s yeah. and 60s and 70s had to make 
to be able to grasp just what the enormity of what this phenomenon is. Um, you know, they're they're in the 1950s and, and they're they're in this kind of a world here, you know? Uh, men and some women in metal spaceships coming to conquer, you know, like that's uh, like they're just coming out of World War II, but they were also in a very strictly uh, technological materialist mindset. And there was no high strangeness that th these folks are really dealing with. Um, and there was this total trust as well in their system. So they were really inclined to believe their government, like, Mm. No crash retrievals, all of that's nonsense. And are you talking about the fifties or the seventies? Well, the, the fifties talking... up to the seventies. Okay. Things started really to change in the seventies. You know, that's really where you start seeing ufology begin to go through its real evolution. Right. You know? Cause um I was reading uh something that he wrote about where he was speaking about the divide within ufology. Oh yes. Yeah. And what were you reading? He didn't use the term ufology. Um, he was just saying how there was this, this is when the paraphysical yes, yes, yes. versus physical right. argument was becoming really real. That's right. So when you're saying there wasn't really high strangeness, that's why I was asking when, because they, they were starting to dig into that. And um, no, that's true. That's true. I mean, even like valet and keel, by the late 60s. Right, was it interdimensional? Were, that's, yeah, absolutely. You know, and so, but. Um, they were taking some serious baby steps, but yeah, they were doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Keel had this idea of, uh, he called ultra terrestrials. Right. You know, because he was thinking like, these beings are really working on a level beyond. Mm -hmm. And Valet was, was going there too, so. Mm -hmm. Um, but compared with later years, I just think it's it's gone into a, a much more involved um, state. I mean, there were back then there were a, there were a few, mm -hmm. but it was it did cause a divide. You're right. Yeah, he, he was writing right. about that right around the time. I think it was around 1980. He was writing, yeah. sort of reflecting back on the conference and uh, 1978. Well, what happened is when the Condon Committee gave their ultimate smackdown of UFOs yeah. in 1969, like that was the signal for ufology to just like regroup and almost rethink. So what you mm -hmm. see during the 70s is this definite expansion of these alternate theories about what was the mm -hmm. phenomenon. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Stringfield's referring to that. And the implications, of course, of crash retrievals is that's all nuts and bolts, man. That's right. It's totally that's material. That's Stringfield. And he realized, you know, that will be the ultimate proof that it's got to be something like that. So he kind of felt like, why are we wasting our time with exploring the paraphysical? Like, let's, let's get let's, into the technology. If these crash retrievals, we should be putting all effort onto crash retrievals because if they're real, that's it. We've got it. Case closed. There's a cover up, and we need to, you know. Well, it's true. Move and this forward. There have was, this exposed. There was one uh, statement. I think it was by Eric Davis in an interview he gave. A year or two ago, uh, it might have been with Alejandro Rojas, um, and he he said something that I think is really right on, and it's, I think it's really cutting edge. So he said, "Look, you're dealing with a phenomenon that is ultra. I don't remember the word he used, like sentient and almost precognitively sentient, like can think way ahead of us." Mm -hmm. and almost knows what we're going to think before we can think it. Mm -hmm. So there's this almost, you could say, a spiritual element mm -hmm. to it, perhaps. You know, right. there, uh, there's like this non-physical element to the phenomenon in certain ways. Mm -hmm. He said, but it is technological. Right. Like it is technological. So where we're at now is a, a place where we're looking at, this is a really strange phenomenon now. Um, it could very well be that you've got extraterrestrials and we've got them. I, I believe that. I actually really, really strongly believe that we've got ETs uh, in custody and they're, we got their bodies and we yeah. got their tech. Yeah. But but I think I think Davis is right in a way. Like there's there is some serious strangeness here, mm -hmm. and what we've got to do is figure out like how what's the relationship there? Mm -hmm. Is the strangeness the same as these ET bodies, or is the strangeness different? 
from these ET bodies. Like, right? right. That that's really the thing we have to ask. Yeah. Or is it different yet related somehow? Somehow. Yeah. Are these are these ETs uh, able to master dimensions in a way that make them seem like they're going in and out of our our dimensions? Like have they mastered space and time in a way that makes them seem like they're uh, interdimensional. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So that's a thought. Yeah. So if they're that advanced, perhaps they could seem interdimensional in their travel and yet they are still interplanetary, so right. to speak. Yeah. Right. Okay. Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, you know, the most uh, future technology is indistinguishable from magic or, you know, words very closely to that effect. And I think that's maybe what we might be considering. But there are things that really do seem paranormal. And um, mm -hmm. I don't dismiss that stuff. You know, when I started out years ago, I never wanted to look at that. Mm -hmm. I, I even thought abductions and crop circles and mutilations were too much to look at. Mm -hmm. Like, I really did not want to go mm -hmm. back in the 90s. Um, so you but, were not a skinwalker guy? You no, did not I, look no at not in, when I started out. No yeah. way. But the, the phenomenon, like, you have to honestly look at it. You've yeah. got to go where the data tells you. And yeah. if the data is pulling you in a certain direction, you got to go there. Right. And so that's what I've been trying to do. I'm I just try to keep up with the data. Right. And I, I you know, on a good mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. I'm still 50 yards behind. <laughs> so anyway, that's what we have on Stringfield. Uh, I don't have any other thoughts to say, except I really admire the man. Yeah. It's, it, it must, it makes me feel sad when I think back to these guys like Kehoe and Stringfield and how there were probably so many times where they thought they had it. Mm. You know, they probably thought they had the key to break this open. And yes. um, so, you know, I, I feel sad in a way that they never got to see at least what's happening this last year in 2019 and what's happening this year. You know, this sort of, uh, this a bit of a turn where the Navy and the pilots and people are coming out in public and talking about this. Like, I bet they couldn't even imagine that this would that, happen. That would be a shocker so for them. I, it would be a, be a shocker. But I, like I said, I, but they also didn't have to live in a futuristic, you know, 5G totalitarian 24 seven surveillance state <laughs> oh, let's not talk about as well. Stuff. So they got that. <laughs> no, the thing is like in their era, they, yeah, I think it, you know, there is a long road ahead and there still may be a long road ahead for us. Like we think we've made some progress and we have. Mm -hmm. And depending on the day of the week is my own opinion as to how close or how far we are from really getting a satisfactory, open, publicly acknowledged truth on UFOs. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer ultimately that we will get one, but um, I don't know. The, the way I look at our system now is I call it legal illegality. Like it's a totally right. illegal system of secrecy, but they're able to give it the veneer of legality and uh, it's totally wrong. And I think what, what good research, I've been really feeling this for a while. What really good research needs to do moving forward is kind of reboot uh, Stringfield in right. a sense and look at hard evidence of bodies, technology, uh, and just get that stuff out. And I think we can. One thing you notice is that there haven't been a lot of, um, or at least a wide number of confirmed crash retrieval stories of the 21st century. Can't be that they're not happening. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems that they're being concealed more effectively mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But I love that we're diving into this. I mean, these there are there is amazing information here for us to look at and... Uh, for us all to look at, right? Um, and it is it is some of the most compelling when we're talking about craft and beings. I think we're all interested in that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we should wrap it up, don't yes. you? Yes. One of yes. our listeners just chimed in. It's two a.m. in some parts of the world. It's getting late. <laughs> We've enjoyed this. That was our friend Jenny. Where? Jen Jenny, who uh, Maimon just said her son walked in, scared the crap out of her. Oh. <laughs> It's, it's 2 a.m. there. So, hey, Jenny. <laughs> hey, Kirsten. Right. I can see you guys. Want to say hello to everyone, all of our friends, and all the new people. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Uh, I would encourage you to check out this YouTube channel. If you like what you see here, subscribe. It always helps us. Uh, like the video, that always helps. Smash the like button. 
go check out some of our other, other videos. We got a lot of interesting stuff here on YouTube. It's all free. It's all here. If you're interested in what we're doing when we're not on YouTube, go to our website, Richard Olin Members. Uh, Tracy and I have a lot of uh, uploaded content, mostly for members. Some of it's free. By all means, check out what we're up to. We uh, definitely love to see you there as well. Yep, sounds great. And all we right. have a, just to let you know, we have a newsletter as well. And if you sign up for it and you haven't been able to find it in your inbox, because we have been sort of releasing it at different times while we've been traveling, you can always go to our website that Richard was just talking about, richarddillonmembers.com. There's a tab called newsletter and all the archives will be, there'll be an archive link and you can get any of them there. So really would like to thank everyone for your support in, uh, for the work that we do. It means a lot. Definitely appreciate it. Do visit us on our site, visit us on our channel and we will be around. We're going to do this in two weeks. Right. And a week from today will be a Richard Olin show. You want to repeat interview. that announcement just because that's those, just the very beginning. If you came late. Yeah. So we're doing every other week, intelligent disclosure. It's got to be the news. We've got to lose our minds. Okay. You have to. <laughs> so every other Tuesday. We want to be with you. <laughs> every other Tuesday will be this and it's alternating. So then uh, on the Tuesdays that we're not doing this, you will have an, a freshly uploaded Richard Olin show interview with yeah. someone. Uh, next week will be Kathleen Martin. So yeah, don't miss that it's one. It's going to be really good. Yeah, it's going to okay. be great. So that's the system. I'll continue the Saturday live streams while the Blue Book series continues. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, after that, I'm going to rethink uh, how often I want to do those Saturday live streams. It's it's a lot of work, and there's other things that I'm trying to keep up on doing. So yeah, we have a couple we'll other projects you. that we're trying to we have a few, uh, a few trying to work on plus the lectures. So there you go. All right. Okay. That's Chat it, everyone. family, great to see you all. Everybody else, thanks for showing up and uh, being with us tonight. Catch you all later. Take care, everyone.